their life story began with a lie. You know, it was like that piece of me that was missing. Korean Canadians adopted as orphans learn their birth parents may in fact be alive. I love you, mommy. I miss you. I love you. They say Canada ignored the evidence of families being torn apart. Our investigative team uncovered details and stories never heard before. Priscilla Kisan Huang breaks down the heartache and sorrow of people coming to grips with the truth of how they got here. My name is Ki Son. I also go by Priscilla. I'm a journalist and a proud Korean Canadian. Yet lately, I've been digging into a deep, dark period of our past. In the decades after the Korean War, widespread poverty and social pressures paved the way for countless babies to be sent for adoption. Every baby in this room has been abandoned. 500 children a month are exported for adoption with government approval. South Korea seemed to have a surplus of babies and demand was high from Western countries. Many ended up with well-intentioned families around the world, including here in Canada. CBC News cameras were there in 1968 when the first Korean adoptees arrived in Toronto to much fanfare. Today, those toddlers are now grown adults, many naturally curious about their lineage. But what they're beginning to find is that every little clue about their origins may have been a lie. My name is Randeray Tyndale. I'm a Korean Canadian adoptee. My name is Michael Finley. My name is Evelyn Forster. Angela Deepak. Jenny Kitchen Mills. Carl Johnson. Jennifer Duffy. Senna Brock. I'm a Canadian Korean adoptee and I want the truth. I want the truth. And I want the truth. My name is Kelly Faustin, and I want the truth. I got to grow up in this. I just shake my head and go, wow. I feel like I had a regular upbringing. I felt like one of the family. All my needs were taken care of. Did camping, did trips to Disneyland. Happy childhood. Kelly Faustin was born Yoon Soo Chun. She was adopted at the age of four by a family in White Rock, BC. I grew up eating potatoes and pasta and everything was Western. And I didn't know anything different because I couldn't remember anything about Korea. Here in your... Details in the original paperwork she arrived with were scarce. Father, unknown. Mother, no record. This paperwork was what my parents knew. They didn't know much more to tell Based me. on what was written, Kelly grew up believing she was an orphan and that both her parents had died. So I kept asking. And it wasn't and until recently I, that Kelly wanted to see if she had any family members in her birth country. If I don't search now, I may never know what it feels like to have a blood relative. This is, this is who I am. This is where I come from. Despite knowing little about her past, Kelly holds on to her Korean documents so dearly. She asks if I could help her translate them. One thing I notice to try to find any clues. I want to talk to you about two words in Korean. Ki a versus ko a. Ki a literally means abandoned child. In Korean, ko a literally means an orphan. But I noticed a shift, and I want to show you this document. This is the first time that you are officially a an koa, orphan. an orphan on paper. How could Kelly be both an orphan and an abandoned child? Who exactly abandoned her? It took 49 years for you yeah. to get this paperwork. Yeah. A new document she received this spring out of the blue added to the complexity. The adoption agency told her they had found her birth father in Korea, meaning her original papers that said father no record were false. As a adoptee trying to learn about my origins, that's a big deal. People uh, played God. Thank you so much for doing this, because without that, I needed a Korean that I trusted. Kelly's story is not unique. 
We spent months speaking to dozens of Korean adoptees. Some had more clues than others about their birth parents. Regardless, every single adoptee arrived with an orphan certificate, officially cutting them off from any family in South Korea. My name is Kim Alexander McKay, but my Korean name is Kim jung -soo. I was adopted in 1975, straight from Korea to East Vancouver. And you had your original Korean documents. What did they say about you? Uh, well, I was left by my family. Yeah, I was banned on the street. Kim McKay grew up feeling alone in the world. Why had his parents abandoned him? He lived half his life heartbroken. For a while, he didn't even know he was Korean. One day, by a miraculous fluke, his birth mother was able to track him down. Once the DNA test came back, it was like I looked at my wife and my two young children. I was like, we're going to Korea. They opened the door and this woman walks in. She's pretty much knocked my kids to the side and grabbed me and she started screaming and, and crying. And, uh, you know, it was like that piece of me that was missing. After he met his mom, she told him the true story behind his adoption. My parents divorced, and uh, my grandmother decided to put me up for adoption. Kim shares there. his paperwork with me as well. And right there, it says, you know, you were just found. Yeah, they said that I was abandoned on the street, and, um, and now I know that that wasn't true either. Uh, my grandmother dropped me off, and, and my poor mom, she had no clue. Kim says he's simply lucky. Having a blood bond, an ocean away, means the world to him. But he doesn't speak Korean. His mom doesn't speak English, meaning he can't just casually call her to chat. So I help him. Amma. Oh. I want to introduce you to uh, my friend Priscilla. 안녕하세요. <웃음> 어, 제, 예, 제 이름은 황기선이고요. 지금 캐나다의 방송국에 일하는 기자예요. I just said I love you. I love you, mommy. 사랑한대요. 사랑해. It's funny because I was 49 years old. I'm no longer an orphan. I actually belong to a family now. Kim's mother spent 30 years wondering if her son was dead or alive and where he could be in the world. We managed to connect with her in Seoul. Seo Dong-nim talks about having her son taken away from her against her will, simply because she was divorced. I miss you, I love you, I you. I miss you. The pain of what happened is still so raw. <laughs> South Korean society is grappling with the painful truth of its adoption history. Children shuffled out overseas to avoid shame, adoption agencies cashing in, all of it signed off by the South Korean authorities. Lee Kyung Un is a former director of Amnesty International Korea, who now heads up Human Rights Beyond Borders. I would say that the relevant authorities of South Korean government worked as a factory of mass production of orphan documents. She's calling out the deceptive tactics by both adoption agencies and government authorities. The orphan documents were uh, produced and issued by government authorities. But uh, I can find no evidence that each individual case was really assessed and investigated by those authorities to figure out that those children were really orphan or not. This orphan making procedure was totally illegal. That was really a big tragedy in the history of this country. But what about Canada? There are clues in this faded photo of a baby who was kidnapped in South Korea. The toddler was adopted into Canada and raised by a BC family. 
That case prompted us to dig through decades of once classified material on international adoptions at the National Archives in Ottawa. There were calls for a full-scale investigation into all Korean adoptions, but we couldn't find records of any such action. We came across old letters and telegrams raising alarm bells, some calling the kidnapping case a predicament, a serious complication. Hi, Dad. <laughs> How's it going? Really good. So adoptions of so-called Korean orphans kept happening, which allowed for people like Kelly Faustin to arrive on our shores four years after that kidnapping case. You've only scratched the surface of this. Are you finding it overwhelming? Very much so. It appears federal officials never directly cautioned Canadians, including Kelly's adoptive father, Jim Faustin. If I had have had the opportunity of knowing He's about now that. learning from his daughter that yeah. the adoption papers that were handed to him decades ago were very misleading. My first impression when I heard this, well, what, what, what was that? Is that, that was like human trafficking? Is that, were we talking about human trafficking? I was with the RCMP. I had a top secret security clearance. I wasn't going to do anything illegal that was going to jeopardize that. It just wouldn't have happened. But I would have been pissed off, livid. Would I have changed anything? No, when I think of all the memories that we have of her growing up from the time she arrived until going through school, all her, not a snowball's chance in hell. Because look what we've got. We got Kelly, didn't we? I can't even express it in words. For Kelly, the bombshell discovery that she has a birth father who may still be alive brings her more anger when it should bring her joy. I want the Canadian government to investigate. I want them to figure out and look into the cases. How could Canada have gone into agreements? Did they know about this? Kelly longs for a relationship with her birth parents, whose whereabouts the Korean Adoption Agency appears to know, but refuses to share, citing privacy reasons. This is sent with all my love in hopes you find the strength to move forward with me. Kelly decides to write a letter to her birth father. It's all she can do for now. I want to share with you that I've had a good life. I've been raised to be healthy, strong, and independent. Would you please send a letter to me? Sincerely, Kelly Foskin, Yoon Soo Jun. Hey, son, this is extraordinary journalism. And, and I'm wondering, as I watch it, what more you can tell us about the, the role governments play here, what responsibility they bear? Well, Adrian, in South Korea, they've launched a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and they're looking into the cases of hundreds of adoptees around the world, including here, one here in Canada. They're tasked with uh, looking into possible allegations of falsification of documents, um, human rights violations. And meanwhile, here in Canada, the government told us that they are monitoring that inquiry but they did not comment on the calls from Canadian adoptees uh, for a, for a full-scale investigation here. All right, well, we know you'll stay on it. Priscilla Kisan Huang, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, how the India-Canada rift is playing out in Punjab. There's no need to repeat uh, the demands of Khalistan. We are happy. The view from India, next. surprising truth about the dream of a separate sick homeland. Things have changed a lot. That movement is at the root of Canada's rift with India. No ma'am, there is a no Khalistani movement in Punjab. But in Punjab, where the dream took shape, six tell us they reject it. Still, as an election looms in India, the crusade for Khalistan remains a hot button issue. Our South Asia correspondent Slima Shivji breaks down why. The holiest of temples for sick pilgrims, golden in the afternoon light, a place of devotion and to capture memories. The songs religious and spiritual, but this was also the site of violence and turmoil nearly 40 years ago. 
an insurgency of armed Sikh separatists fighting for an independent state called Khalistan occupied the temple. Indian soldiers laid siege, eventually storming the holy site. Thousands of Sikhs died in the riots that followed, the pain still raw in Punjab. And yet, many here flatly reject the idea of a Sikh state. I proud to be feel an Indian. Like Amanpal Singh, who's more worried about the economy. No, ma'am, there is a no Khalistani movement in Punjab. That there is a need of the, uh, right now, the employment. A deep concern that ripples through the heart of Punjab an area that many young people have abandoned to go study abroad. Even if the hot topic of discussion these days is how Ottawa is accusing New Delhi of having a hand in the shooting death of a Canadian Sikh separatist on Canadian soil. What even is Khalistan, Sardur Singh says. We don't know, it's all politics and we are the ones who suffer. This man was a police officer in the 1980s when anti-Sikh riots gripped the capital. There were dead bodies in the streets, Naseeb Singh Sangna says. Many don't remember the dark days. Why would we want to return to that unrest? There is a fierce anger here at the Indian government and a sense that Punjab has been slighted and not given its due. But also the sense that fighting for Khalistan isn't the answer. I think there is no need to repeat uh, the demands of Khalistan. We are happy. Happy as part of India, less happy to be caught in a political game for votes, people here say. By India's ruling BJP, intent on deepening divides. Near elections, they have just an election ploy. Let's talk about Khalistan. Let's create a mess in the people. We stand for. There is a section of Sikh society in Punjab that's still fighting, and they argue that support for their movement is strong but silent. Over here, there is a fear of uh, crackdown. There is a fear of harassment. There is a fear of being booked under draconian laws, which is not in the case in Canada, UK, and USA. Whatever we see in diaspora, that is the reflection of the movement in Punjab. So many people here tell me they fear the power of social media to exaggerate support for Khalistan. They worry that all Sikhs are being branded Khalistanis, terrorists. And most say there's a clear disconnect between how they see the fight for an independent state and how the Sikh diaspora sees it. A view frozen in time. Abruptly came to an end in 1992, 93. Even though support for Khalistan in Punjab collapsed in the early 90s, says this expert, the diaspora clings to a past that's no longer. They don't go by the logic. Sometimes they go by the history. Some they go by the, that glorious period. Okay, that, that was there. But things have changed a lot. Changed and evolved with other more pressing concerns now top of mind. A sixth state for those here, no longer a priority. Now, our South Asia correspondent, Salima Shivji, who just saw there, tells us that municipal elections in Punjab are slated for November. A national vote comes next year. Next, a birthday song at a major concert. Yeah, that's Coldplay serenading a 10-year-old BC boy in our moment. So Coldplay made a surprise move at their Vancouver show over the weekend, bringing Brian Adams to the stage. But there was another surprise in the store as well. Frontman Chris Martin picked a 10-year-old birthday boy out of the crowd and performed an impromptu song just for him. The priceless memory is our moment. We got floor seats for my birthday. That was my birthday present. And me and my dad and my mom sort of just was like, excuse me, it's my birthday. And we were just pushing to the front. And I was on my dad's shoulders holding a big pink poster. And he was reading all the posters. And said, that young boy in the crowd, can you please come up here? What's your, what's your name? And he told me to wave out to the crowd. I couldn't believe it. I was just like, wait, what? What else did he do today on your birthday? He would just ask me questions and started just making up words and was singing them. And she's sitting with me. And then he made a cool, good song. I can't think of a better place to be when you turn 10. It was just like, what? How is this happening? What is happening? Oh my gosh. We blow you away. 
It was just the best day ever. And get this, on his way home on the C bus, concert goers recognized Leo and they all sang to him too. Happy birthday, Leo. From all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.